Right, my darling, how the devil are you? So I realised at the end of yesterday's walk that uh, that normal two hours walk that I do, river and then canal, just isn't long enough sometimes to get out all the one I talk about. Um, there was a, a big list of things I wanted to talk about yesterday that I, I only really touched the surface of. Um, and if you remember, Bully Rimmer will remember, because it was just a few seconds ago for you, but it was several hours ago for me. But uh, I was talking about um, the, the people that have chips on their shoulders and how it seems to be in so many professions uh, these days. And I'm going to come on to that and talk about it in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, but I was giving you the example of, of, of me and my job when I was um, employed by the uh, parking contractor for Manchester City Council and um, and some of the people that were employed there and uh, at the end of the day it's it was shocking really to, to see just how many people um, and, and word of mouth of course as well you know when when you find a job like that if if you're you're that way inclined that you, you do have a chip on your shoulder and and therefore you love the job because of that um, then you're gonna tell your friend who might also have a chip on their shoulder and you know before you know it everybody that works there has a chip on their shoulder um, and is doing the job for the same reason and I can see now that you know in hindsight um, you realize why traffic wardens have such a bad reputation because generally speaking they are all like that it's um, it's like the police force as well you know you're always going to get one good one good copper um, that's reasonable and fair and it's just upholding the law and um, you know wants to keep the peace at, at all cost but really um, in the parking game um, you know in that job there were, were very few of those people. I mean, I'd like to say, like me, you know, um, there are very few people like me working for that company where um, they were just there just to do a job and to keep the streets clear of traffic. Because ultimately, if you think about it, that, that's why we, we pay our taxes that then goes to the local councils and then the local councils then contract out uh, parking enforcement in big towns and city centres to private limited companies. And, um, and so therefore us taxpayer payers are paying. Why are we paying that much money for parking to be enforced? Because we want the streets to be clear. You know, it, when um, the mass um, road um, a road and motorway building started to occur and was it like 50s, the 60s that it really sort of took off and they realised that loads of people had more and more people were getting cars there was increased levels of traffic on the road, cities and towns were becoming congested and then that's you know when gradually you started to see um, the introduction of loads of traffic regulation laws um, more and more each year of course but the majority the bulk of it was done back then when they realized that towns and cities were becoming congested and um, and therefore you know they, they had to start producing loads of yellow paint and, um, and white paint and inventing the whole not inventing creating the, the whole um, the highway code maybe it was around about the same time perhaps a bit earlier and uh, the, the rules and regulations that govern, govern and bylaws that govern um, CPZs, controlled parking zones, and um, and everything that, that you now see, you know, all the rules and regulations that you now see, and why um, thousands of companies across the UK make billions of pounds every year in parking. Yeah. Um, councils do private companies do, uh, some supermarkets do, billions of pounds in parking um, because of the new laws. 
Oh, why am I talking about this? Well, we we needed these, you know. We we didn't when we started drifting from um, transport by horse and car, and uh, tra you know, goods and passenger transport was uh, was train and horse and cart and and barges and canals, um, and suddenly we started moving from that into uh, everyone having their own car and being able to afford their own car um, then towns and cities started needing these rules and regulations in order to stem the flow of, you know and stop the, the chaos the, the traffic jams in, in towns and cities across across the uk um, so the, the rules and regulations that are there are predominantly there for good reason. We might moan about the traffic warden, but he's actually enforcing rules and regulations which are sensible, they're there for a reason. However, um, the, pro the problem, one of the problems with rules and regulations is that they are misinterpreted and can seem stupid and pointless sometimes. You know, if you're um, if you're parking on a street and there's nobody there, and you're parked illegally on the street, but there's nobody there, then you're not actually doing any harm. You know, there's both two sides to this, and you can see, a, you know, fair play if you if you put three pound in the parking meter and put your display your ticket in the window you know, on the windscreen, um, and then you overshoot by an hour because your meeting started late or something like that. Fair enough, right? You paid for a certain amount of time, it's your fault, or it's, it's, um, it's maybe matters beyond your control, but it's still nevertheless your your problem that you, you didn't, somebody else could have had that space, yeah? Um, to keep the flow of traffic and give everyone a fair chance of parking in the, in the town or city centre. Um, but you can see why some punters get annoyed with the traffic wardens when because they're just going around doing doing the job in a in a not logical fashion not in, in a non-friendly manner um, they're enforcing laws just for the sake of enforcing laws rather than for the purpose that the laws were created in the first place um, and therefore you get jobs worth get a proper job all that kind of stuff I know, I did it. I did it for four years odd, um, maybe five, can't remember. And uh, I've faced all of that. So there's two sides to every story. As I've mentioned before, and um, the, I've tried to portray myself as somebody that did that job. Um, and that it wasn't really particularly suited to me, but that um, it wasn't really the sort of thing that I could do. I, I wanted to enforce, I, I, I can appreciate that it was, I, I, I could enforce laws, I was given the power to enforce laws, or bylaws, or regulations, or whatever you want to call them. And I was given the power to do that. <laughs> And to, for all the things that we've just talked about, keeping traffic flowing, being fair to everybody, giving everyone a fair chance, um, reducing traffic jams and chaos and um, confusion within city and town centres. They, they were the, the, the reason why I thought I was doing the job. As a result of that, you might, you might sort of say, Sorry mate, yeah, you know, um, if you stay here, then I'm going to have to give you a ticket. But if you go now, you know, everything's fine. And there are certainly lots of situations like that. You know, ah, oh, sorry mate, you, you are actually causing an offence. Um, but, you know, if you go now, that's fine. Or, uh, the, the other way of looking at it, sometimes, um, there are time limits, you know, like, I think it was two minutes. You, you, you can issue a ticket after two minutes parking on the yellow line. And, um, and if the two minutes had gone, 
and the ticket was already being printed coming out the machine or already stuck on the windscreen then sorry mate that I, I've done it now is nothing I can do about that but you can appeal against it you know all the details are on the back of it because you think you had a valid reason for being there um, good luck with that and uh, yeah my name is 129 and um, and uh, and good luck you know but there's there's nothing I can do now um, so there were situations like that however there were there is an, a, another element to this story which I didn't get around to talking about yesterday and that is there is a certain excitement from conflict. I was thinking about that this morning. Am I com am, was I completely an angel in that job? No. I, I, I'm honest enough to say there is an element of excitement from riling someone up the wrong way. You know, if you see some, some rich twat with a Ferrari parks illegally, just cockily just parks because he thinks he owned the, owns the place. You're gonna, you're gonna be more likely to think, yes, I gave a Ferrari driver a ticket. You know, um, and because of that, because of that, you can see how it would be easy to, uh, if you had a chip on your shoulder against society. Yeah. Traffic was a problem, so here I am, down by the river. Um, yeah, if you had a chip on your shoulder against society, then um, a job like being a parking attendant is an ideal place to to vent your fury at the world. You know, if you don't like black people, or you don't like travellers, or you don't like old people, or you don't like people who have disabled badges and appear not to be disabled or you don't like people who are rich and have big cars or you don't like people who drive shitty little bangers um, with no tax disc you know uh, the, the list is endless whatever your grudge is against society um, there's something for you there um, you can you can go and get a job as a parking attendant and vent all your anger on the world or you, i mean maybe you maybe you even just you're just anti-society generally, you're just anti-people, you just like having an argument. That's part of your personality is your, you like having an argument. Or, as we said at the beginning, you've got a chip on your shoulder. You know, you think the world owes you something because you're black or because you're gay or because you haven't got any money yourself or because, um, you know, you, you lost a finger during the war or something, you know. So, I, I'm, I'm just picking, plucking things out of the air there um, uh, to, to try and describe um, the personalities of lots of the people that I worked there, with there and, um, and they, most of them certainly fit into that kind of, um, uh, sort of category, if you like, of somebody that was doing the job and enjoyed it very much and looked forward to, if not tried to create situations where conflict was going to arise and this adds to the hatred for parking attendants and this it just keeps going backwards and forward and getting worse and worse you know as long as the parking attendants are, are drawn from that kind of uh, pool of people um, they're always going to have that attitude if they have that attitude um, then the, the punters, the general public, are always always going to be uh, going to have their attitude towards traffic wardens. You say traffic warden, do you like traffic wardens to anybody? And I guarantee that the you know in the in the high street, I can guarantee that the majority of the answers will be, ah yeah, fucking wankers hate traffic wardens. They need to get a proper job. And you know there's some element of truth in that. Um, if, they, if the traffic wardens were actually, um, we paid our taxes to the, to the local councils and the councils, whether they did it themselves or the police did it or the actual traffic wardens did it or parking attendants did it or they contracted it out, one way or another, 
what needs to be done with that money is smooth flow of traffic, a fair rotation of traffic um, within towns and centers, city centers. Um, that's it. That's all that needs to happen. You know, um, and if, if that works, great. Uh, and that's the need to employ people um, that have a, th th a bit of sense up here, you know, a bit of um, a bit of humanity, a bit of logic that allows them to say, yeah, yeah, go on, mate. Yeah, it's uh, you're working meeting events, but I'll let you go, but don't do it again, kind of thing, you know. Um, but sadly that that kind of person is lacking from that job and unfortunately um, that seems to be the same because as I mentioned yesterday lots of the um, public sector service industries um, the police force um, who else so we got, who, let's have a make a list right a list of places where I think in my opinion you are more likely to find that kind of person. Okay, so let's let's make a list, and maybe you can add to this list, or maybe you disagree with me, but let's just see where it goes. So, the police, for a start. Um, the, the police are often accused, not just in this country, in America too, and probably some other Western countries, and maybe all over the world. Um, some of the police, more recently, have been, some of the police, not all of them, some of them have been accused more recently, but it does affect the whole force of um, being, you know, trying to enforce ridiculous things, um, the, the COVID regulations, or, you know, um, refusing to give your name when you're stopped, or not even knowing, not even knowing the, the, the codes for the driving, um, the, the reasons why they pulled someone over for driving, you know, without this or that or the other. And, um, and just general ineptitude um, from from lots of especially younger police. Um, the good old fashioned village bobby walking the streets just making sure everything's going on okay um, seems to have disappeared and been replaced by someone that wants to know your name and all your details about you um, and gets angry and confused and and agitates you if you don't give all of those details and just seems to seems to be absolutely set on when they have an encounter with someone trying to find the smallest thing that they can pick on to make that person um, pay a fine or go to court or be arrested you know they, they seem to take great pride in escalating sis, uh, situations um, from very calm nothing going on here kind of thing to oh well if that's your attitude then we're, we're going to arrest you and just you know basically wasting our money again wasting our money maybe the the law that they're actually enforcing or using or suggest suggesting it is correct but the, like just like with the traffic wardens the laws were there design uh, the laws were designed for certain situations in extreme situations you know to, to uphold um, everything in society to uh, a high standard and they're just misusing and misrepresenting the laws in order just to nab somebody just to get their own back on society um, and again you know the list of the list is endless for the reasons that you might want to do that that person's got a, a, a scruffy car so I'm gonna pull them over that person's got too much money and they've got a Ferrari. I'm going to pull them over. That person's black. I'm going to pull them over. Uh, there's four guys looking suspicious with shaven heads in a car together, bopping up, bopping along to some music. Um, I'm going to pull them over. You know, too many tattoos. I'll pull them over. It's, the list is just endless. The reasons, the excuses they come up with, um, and not just traffic fences either. You know, on the street stop and search and all that kind of stuff um, stupid pathetic reasons that they come up with because they think they're all powerful and they can get away with it because they're wearing a uniform and um, at the end of the day they're just they're just doing it to try and find something to pick on they just want to pick on the smallest thing if they can't get you on that they'll get you on that yeah all you have to do is go onto YouTube and, um, and type in 
police owned or police fail, you know, or anything like that. And you can see, and I applaud these guys that post up videos where they record themselves with interactions with the police um, and where they stick up for their rights. You know, they, you know, by, under law such and such, I don't have to give my name. Um, under, under law such and such, you do have to supply me with your, your PC number and your, uh, your badge number and your name. Um, you have to give me a reason why you've stopped me or ser want to search me. You know, you have to have um, a reason to be suspicious of me having committed this crime, etc, etc. Um, so I, I applaud those guys uh, on YouTube. Um, some of them, you know, where, where somebody is obviously just being picked on for no apparent reason and, um, and they're stick it, sticking up for themselves. And, and I, I advise anybody to go and learn just the basic facts of the law. Uh, when can you be stopped? You only have to go onto YouTube and you find loads of videos. When are you allowed to be stopped? What do they have to say? What do they have to provide? What are you obliged to provide or not? Um, uh, the same goes whether it's you know, in a driving or walking down the high street, you know. Go and become aware of your rights as a citizen um, so that you don't have to piss take them like that. Um, however, having said that, and veering off at a slight angle here, um, there are just as many sites on YouTube or people on YouTube that post up videos where the person is obviously antagonising the police in order to test out these these laws and regulations. You know, like walking around. In the UK, you're allowed to film in public. You don't have to get anyone's permission. Um, and police buildings and car parks where the police park are public property. We pay for them with our taxes. Um, and therefore, officially, you're allowed to walk around with a camera like I am now, recording what's going on, recording the buildings, recording the police cars. You know, no one, no one is actually allowed to stop you from doing that. Um, unless perhaps you know you've, you're armed with a bazooka and you could um it looks like you know you've got a mask over your face a balaclava and it looks like you're gonna take a take a 10 foot hole through the building with the bazooka uh, and cause a, a terrorist incident you know um unless that's the case then i'm sure there's laws that they can suddenly invoke for that but but some of these guys are absolute our souls actually going into these places blatantly walking around to attract the attention of the people inside and then being all angsty when they come out and well i'm allowed to do this that, that you know that's not fighting the cause the fight that the true cause should be and the police should be behind, be behind us with this as well we want good coppers on the streets that know the law and um, aren't made to look fools off and uphold the law and just do the, their best to spend the taxpayers' money efficiently and wisely um, without just wasting it on silly, silly twaddle. You know what I mean? Anyway, that's, that's that. Um, so, the, the, the police, that's how did I get onto all of that? Well, talking about the, the, the fact that it is unfortunate that perhaps, you know, the police force more and more from, from what I've seen um, is possibly um, there, there's more and more people with chips on the shoulder that are working there um, and have got nothing better to do than to just vent their anger because they're wearing a uniform and can get away with it against society um, and also knowing of course in the UK police force at least that there's um, there's very little consequence for it you know if a if a man, if a man in the street stabs someone and the police officer, uh, let's say shoot, right? If a man in the street shoots someone and the police officer shoots someone in um, the, the court or the appeal or whatever, um, possibly they might be looked at in to two different lights and the police officer might get a, a less of a punishment for, for having done that um, or less of an investigation. But that, that's another story maybe for another day. Um, just going to stop and have a quick cup of tea here and I'll come back to this in a minute. You can kind of see how um, 
in a way this ties into what I was talking about yesterday or today if you're still watching the same video um, uh, when I was talking about my dad and the way uh, the way that he was um, just picking on the smallest thing inventing creating a, um, a cause a reason for an argument when there's when there's nothing to be argued about you know um, the way that the police are accused of being sometimes um, is very very similar to that you know my dad just wanted an argument that was it he, he wanted bad feeling and an atmosphere and to, to, to moan about something complain about something and punish someone for something um, and that was inbuilt into his personality and unfortunately it looks like um, there are police out there that, that are like that um, so uh, police um, but unfortunately it's not just police that attracts I'm not just picking on the police um, uh, it's it's other types of um, uh, occupations as well where, that attract this kind of thing and you'll have seen it in your high streets uh, everywhere um, so the, the people that have suddenly appeared again contractors for the local council probably um, working for a private limited company uh, that's making profit by charging 120 pound if they see you dropping a cigarette butt on the floor they this that profession also seems to attract that sort of person uh, and you only have to look at them you know look at them how they're dressed and what they look like and um, the way that they behave um, you can see it every day on Market Street in Manchester these guys they're hiding hiding behind like electricity boxes or something um, targeting foreign student or, or, often um, foreign students uh, because you know for, or tourists because they don't know the laws like like you know most English people do do, do more at least um, and there'll be you know the, there's plenty of English language teaching schools in Manchester I used to work for one I still do apparently um, and the, the students go outside for a cigarette at the break time or the lunch time and um, drop the cigarette but on the floor because that's probably what they do in their country or it's not found on in their country perhaps and as soon as that person walks away and leaves that rubbish on the floor whether it's a cigarette butt or you know a piece of rubbish or a coke can or a McDonald's wrapper or whatever it is um, if they drop it on the floor and leave it there and then walk away and go about their business then they're committing offence they're, they're dropping dropping litter um, I don't know I'm pretty sure it's not a, um, a criminal offence I, I don't know the law inside out but it's probably just a bylaw or something like that um, and they're not allowed to do it you're not allowed to do it uh, you can be fined um, and if you you know, refuse to pay the fine, then you can be taken to court, and all sorts of things probably can follow from that. Um, however, the the law, or which it, whatever it is, clearly states that if you drop something on the floor and then pick it up and dispose of it correctly in a bin, um, that, that, that that's fine. You know, everybody does that. You go to get your key, car keys out of your pocket, and uh, something else falls out of your pocket onto the floor. Whoops! I'll pick it up. I didn't realise that had come out, <coughs> or someone will, will point it out. And sometimes maybe it's even like a, a ten-pound note or a twenty-pound note or something, you know. In which case you'd be very grateful that someone, uh, another member of the public, perhaps had, had pointed it out to you that the, that, that had fallen out of your pocket. However, the, the law, the, the law, whatever it is, um, states that if a um, is it a civil enforcement officer or whatever their title is um, if they see you doing that and they all have cameras attached to their um, chest if they see you doing that and record you doing that they have to then give you the opportunity um, once they've told you that you've committed an offence they have to give you the opportunity to pick it up and put it in a bin correctly and if that's the case then you can walk away scot-free but they don't do that a lot of the time um, they will just get the, the unsuspecting tourist or, or foreigner and, um, and issue the fine, take their name and details um, and that's another £120 in that private limited, limited company's bank account and um, you know that, that's the way it goes on. So you, you do get people again attracted to that profession 
uh, that are like that. Um, again, more recently in the last, is it five or maybe 10 years, uh, we've seen the introduction of PCSOs, um, support officers basically for the police uh, force, um, which who have certain powers, but they're not allowed, they're, they're not warranted um, like a police constable is. Um, so the PCSOs are basically the ones that are now walking the streets, whereas the police would have done that in the past. And, um, and they have certain powers um, to detain people and you know, if they suspect that a crime is being committed, etc, etc. And a lot of the time they have to actually have to uh, wait for an actual policeman, if they're not busy, to come along and finish off the job, so to speak. Um, again, that kind of profession does seem to attract people that have that chip on their shoulder and just are just want to pick on people uh, and bully people and, um, and especially pick on people that are unaware of the rules and regulations um, for, for their own benefit. You probably notice it with security guards, um, security, anybody. In fact, when I was briefly unemployed many years ago, um, one of the things that I was um, encouraged very strongly to do was to do, a, to, to do a free course. They offer free courses when you're unemployed and you pretty much have to go on them. You have to choose which one you want to do and go on them um, in order to keep claiming your, your benefit, you know, your, um, your, your rent being paid and some money every week because you're unemployed. Um, and one of the courses which I actually did was um, a security guard course of some kind um, where they, they teach you the basics of what, is, what you need to know to be a security officer. Um, and then you find these people working, um, standing on the door at, at Tesco's, um, uh, walking around, shopping malls, shopping arcades. Again, that kind of profession does attract people that want that power, they, they, they crave that power. Also, you, you'll find these people at train stations. Um, when you come off the train at uh, Manchester Piccadilly train station, for example, um, there's barriers now everywhere where you have to put your ticket or scan your ticket to get through to prove that you've paid for the journey that you've just done or that you're, you've paid for the journey you're, you're about to take on the train. Um, and there's sometimes, well, especially at the moment during COVID, more security there uh, or ticket checkers or whatever their job title is, there's more of those than there are members of the public forming a great big barrier, you know, like a, a police cordon sort of thing, um, all with their yellow jackets on and their little badges being flashed, um, their, their ID badges. All, all stood there waiting to pounce on the person that hasn't bought a ticket and on the trams as well you know Manchester has a fairly decent now tram service extensive tram network and uh, you, you find exactly the same there that they can sometimes be plain clothed even um, and they they jump on people that, that haven't bought tickets uh, the problem with the with the tram service in my opinion uh, in Manchester possibly the rest of the UK as well I'm not sure is you have to buy your ticket before you get on the tram and if you're stopped on the tram without a ticket th there's no machine on the tram to buy a ticket there's no uh, like you get on a bus you get a bus conductor that oh you haven't got a ticket then you, you can buy a ticket off him or her um, and they can then pull you off at the next stop so to speak and um, <laughs> not literally and uh, Although some people would probably pay for that. <laughs> and uh, they, they get you off the tram at the next stop, you know, you, and, um, and take your name and details and give you a ticket again. Uh, it's, I don't know what it is now. It's, it's probably around about £100. Um, most of these places, um, parking tickets, cigarette butt dropping tickets, um, not paying your tram fare tickets, all tend to be like almost... 80, 100, 120 pound ish. Um, and then you get the option that if you pay within a certain time, like two weeks, then it's half, half the price or something like that. Or you can appeal against it. And I'm sure most people just think, oh, sod it. 
I'll just pay for it, you know, rather than going through the appeal procedure and maybe not even getting any joy out of that. Military, possibly, has um, attracted um, lots of people like that that just want to wear the uniform, they want the power, they want the gun, they want the, to be able to lord it over, over normal, everyday public, you know. Um, and politicians as well, I'm, I'm sure. Um, well, most, most politicians probably go to some private school like Eton or something and, and you know, um, the, the whole politics thing is something I try to stay away from because it just makes me angry um, the way that politics is run, at least in this country. Um, but I'm sure, you know, politicians, that there's a, a good percentage of politicians that are in that job exactly for the same reasons because they want to have that power over of other over other people and like i kind of mentioned briefly yesterday management uh, people that seem to rise to the surface um in companies whether it's uh, or whatever the kind of company it is do seem to uh, they rise to the top through the way that they behave and can end up in positions of senior management um or directorship sometimes when um, all they want is is that power over people um, and again you can see the connection here um, from my discussion earlier or yesterday um, where I was talking about my dad you know uh, my dad being a, a junior school teacher were um, thrived on being able to control a group of young kids and um, and was in his bubble in his classroom. He, he was he was uh, the ultimate power hungry, um, uh, controlling person in in that situation. So you know, um, and maybe even entertainment. Maybe, maybe um, there are um, maybe maybe the same argument could could be. Um, put into uh, transferred over to the entertainment industry, TV, radio, um, celebrity, that kind of thing, where where people just want to, um, they want the power. Although possibly with the entertainment industry, it's 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 more about ego. Another thing that's just crossed my mind is maybe even people like um, people that work in job centres. You know, they can't think of anything else better to do themselves, so they, they want to be in a position of power where they, they can allot people um, jobs and, and training and, and take control over, um, over the, that environment of, of, of work. Um, people in HR, human resources, they've got nothing better to do. They've got no training in any other particular field. Have they not excelled in any other particular field within the company? So they move into human resources and control people. What is the old phrase? Uh, I think was it George Orwell or someone? Um, I can't remember exactly which author it was, but said that those those that can do, and those that can't teach. You know, going back to the teaching thing again, um, and those that can't teach 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 teachers chain teachers <laughs> well that's my job you know what does that say about me <laughs> hopefully I'm not one of these people um, I, I strive really really strive not to be at least uh, so a, a, a big broad subject um, and uh, you know having started talking about my dad and then finishing yesterday talking about people with chips on their shoulder and uh, get wanting to get their own back on society and being power hungry and all of these kind of things you can see there's a the, the general underlying trend here is that it looks like um, that there may there may well be lots of people in our society that are affected um, by NPD um, narcissistic power and narcissistic um, blah, 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 personality disorder um, and it's scary. It really is scary when you think about it. What I wanted to do today, because I, 
I kind of touched on it yesterday and I began by saying that I'll, I'll link some help websites and stuff down below and I, and I will do, I will do that because um, I, I think it's really important that society as a whole um, becomes more aware of all of these um, aspects of psychology and um, is m more prepared for, for dealing with them and it does its best to try and eradicate this, this malignant kind of um, this malignant um, element that, that seems to exist in society um, and perhaps it's getting worse who knows um, so things to look out for if you suspect that there's someone that you know or yourself even maybe um, is suffering from NPD or or anything under that umbrella of um, psychological complaint um, then as soon as I've um, crossed the uh, busy main road in a minute uh, I'll start talking about that okay right so um, I'm gonna give you some lists of things to look out for and uh, it'll be up for you to make your own mind up really um, the things that I've talked about so far my dad and and my childhood and the way things were and the way that he behaved and maybe someone that you know is like that uh, maybe your partner or wife husband friend yourself even um, signs to look out for that might indicate that that person has um, narcissistic personality disorder or something similar because um, they're, they're all kind of interlinked um, there's also something called malignant um, Pers um, narcissistic personality disorder and um, and other different variations too um, that, that all kind of tie into the the element of psychology and um, sociopathy and all, all, all sort of other manner of um, complaints and you know if you just have one in a small proportion then possibly you're just a human being like me you know we all have a positive and negative personality traits you know everybody is different every individual um, is different thank the heavens um, but if if, pers if people have if a person has a cluster of, of the things that I'm about to mention um, and they're often to the extreme you know an extreme version of what we would consider to be a normal personality trait um, then maybe that's the warning signs and something to look out for um, the first one to, to think about is does the person have an exaggerated sense of self-importance think about the professions that I've talked about do you think some people in some of those professions have or others have an exaggerated sense of self-importance um, do you think that number two um, they have a sense of entitlement um, do they require constant excessive admiration uh, like my dad did um, do they think that everything should be theirs because just because um, do they expect to be recognized as superior even without um, the achievements that warrant it um, again that, that ties into the into the second one um, do they exaggerate their achievements and their talents uh, do they you know um, maybe on the CV or in real life in conversation are they always going on about the things that they've done and blowing them out of all proportion so that they seem even better than they are um, does this person or the, this group of people do you think they are preoccupied with fantasies about success um, power um, do you think they they, they crave that they're, they're obsessed with with brilliance um, or beauty even which is kind of where we started yesterday oh. <laughs> Oh, it gets me every time that 
training is difficult when you've got a backpack on and a camera on the end of a stick trying to negotiate obstacles like that and um, so yeah are they obsessed by their own beauty uh, overly obsessive about it um, are they obsessed about finding the perfect mate um, uh, another one to add to the list Whoop. is um, does this person believe that they're superior um, superior to the general public and that they can only associate with equally special people um, you know they're, they're the elite of society and they'll only talk to the elite um, maybe you could say that about us some other people in society as well that, that don't generally work and uh, anyway that's another story um, do they, when you're having a conversation with someone, do you know someone who completely monopolizes that conversation? Um, and does that person belittle or look down on people um, that they consider to be inferior? Um, I'm sure we all know someone that likes this a bit of a chatterbox. We all know people like that. Maybe you're like it yourself. You might say that because I've been talking to myself non-stop for 20 minutes, I'm a bit like it. But, you know, I'm sure we all know people um, that have to be the centre of the attention all the time. Um, does uh, the particular person um, expect special favours um, because of their eliteness? Um, do they want unquestioning compliance with their expectations? Uh, they say something or tell you something they want you to do and that they, they, it doesn't even cross their mind that you might disagree with them or not want to do it or say it, you know? So, so that's another thing to consider. <coughs> um, does that person... the way in it come down here tram goes over I'll stop going on about it one day and just accept it um, or go a different way <laughs> my choice uh, so does that person take advantage of others um, to get what they want um, Places every time that I that I break into a sigh and moan about stuff. We'll be going past the scrapyard in a minute, and I'll moan about that. <laughs> the, the car breakerage, or whatever you call it, you know, people welding and all sorts of other noise. Go on that side of the river, and there's trains going past. Right, there we go. Right, so. Um, yeah, do you know someone that takes advantage of others to get what they want? Um, this this uh, especially might manifest itself in a business situation or when you're working for a company. And we talked about this briefly as well, how some, some people seem to trample over others on their way to the top um, in order to, they're very focused on what they want and nobody's going to get in the way of it. Um, does this person have an inability or an unwillingness to recognise the needs and the feelings of others? Um, again, I can tie this one into my dad because I never felt throughout my childhood um, that he recognised my needs as a human being or my feelings as a human being. Um, my, my sadness, my happiness, my, um, my joy, you know, all the, the whole range of human emotions that, and feelings that we have um, that you, you, surely when you have kids you want to share in those moments, 
um, help out in those moments. Um, try, try if you can to, to love and care and attention and um, uh, being tuned in to your kids uh, at whatever age. Surely as a parent you want to um, help to, to guide, to steer your, your children in, in the right way, to, to celebrate with them their, their, the good things that they've achieved and, um, and to commiserate and, and um, console, you know, when, when things aren't going so well. Um, but I, I think, I, I'm pretty sure that either my dad didn't, he had the inability to recognise all of those things in me, not just me, uh, you know, the rest of my family too. He had the inability, he just, it wasn't programmed in him to understand all those things or recognise all those things, or he was unwilling to, for whatever reason. Um, unwilling because it, it, you know, it tied into his own insecurity or um, he just didn't know what to say or do in those in different situations. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a programming thing, surely, you know? That's the, 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 a wire that's not been connected correctly somewhere up there. Um, do I think it was my dad was unwilling or incapable of um, noticing these things? difficult to say, very difficult to say and this is, again, this is one of the regrets that I've had, is that during his lifetime, you know, when he was still alive, I didn't question this or uh, look into this more or ask him about it or explore it with him um, to, to help him, if nothing else, to help him so that he could help us. Um, if he had a, a complaint, then, you know, there are various things that you can do to, to try and um, to put it right. I don't think scientists have found a cure. There's no drug. There's no um, immediate remedy to someone with MPD. Um, but there are all sorts of um, psychological practices uh, that you can go through um, and, and regimes and routines and um, therapy that you can go through and, um, and get in order to help you or the person with it to, to go through it. The problem, of course, is that the very nature, by the very nature of NPD, the person is, co is often completely oblivious to the, to the fact that they have it and therefore unwilling to undertake any kind of psychotherapy. Um, uh, and that's the sad thing about it. It's, uh, most of the people, even if they're diagnosed with it, are unwilling to go ahead with any kind of therapy that might cure them or, or alleviate the problem. Um, what's that other thing that you can have done? Um, it's like, uh, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, so if I can later on then I'll, I'll pop it up on the screen, but it's a type of therapy that, that helps you to realise, to recognise, to self-reflect um, on the way that you behave. and. Um, Cognitive something, cognitive, um, something cognitive behavioural therapy. CBT? Is that it? Cognitive behavioural therapy? I think that's what it might be. Um, or something similar. Um, and that's designed and apparently very, very successful at um, easing, if, if nothing else, um, a person to, and helping them to, to come to terms and recognise when they're behaving like it, why they're behaving like it, and to explore these things in the hope that they can try and stop themselves before that happens and do something about it and gradually improve. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not sure uh, whether he was unwilling to recognize my feelings or um, incapable of doing so and maybe even a bit of both, you know, maybe even a bit of both. Um, another thing, um, which didn't, didn't sort of manifest itself quite so much with my dad was, um, but it's another trait of NPD, and that's someone that is envious of other people, um, and, but also at the same time believes that other people envy them. You know, it's a, a kind of a double-edged sword, that. 
um, secretly envies and is jealous of what other people have or do or say or have achieved um, but, sec but also secretly be believes is convinced that the other people envy them um, so that's another one uh, what else um, this, uh, this one next one also ties into people that work in businesses and work their way up and trample on other people to get to the top and that is the the fact that they they often behave in an arrogant or haughty manner um, again that ties into always belittling other people um, so behaving in an arrogant manner um, and you know you, you see this every Saturday night you know when Covid's not here you see it every Saturday night um, outside the Weatherspoons on Teensgate but um, but perhaps there's a certain element of that in the population too um, sometimes these people often come across as conceited um, um, about what they've achieved um, boastful you know um, always going on about um, what they've done they've done or they haven't done um, pretentious you know the, these are all adjectives that could describe someone with MPD and another thing which kind of um, is limited oh, in um, the, the way that the, my dad behaved is that these people often insist on having the best of everything uh, this could be the best car or the best office in the building you know, they they insist that everyone bows and and um, curtsies to them and and are completely oblivious to the fact that other people uh, deserve or might want that that bigger office or whatever but they they, they think that um, that that they are entitled to having the best having the best of everything and in a way that does it is I, I can tie that into my dad in a way because um, whenever they bought like a, a fridge freezer or um, anything for the house you know um, furniture um, electrical equipment anything that that was going to go into the house um, they they my, my, my dad was always did loads of research in, in making sure that he got the best thing and that's a good quality to have of course but being obsessed with that um, is, is another element that can reflect on that person having NPD um, just gonna have another quick cup of tea now need to try and get the lighting sorted and so I'm not just a silhouette all the time um, and after after the break we'll be talking about um, some of the ways that people behave who have NPD and uh, so and again a, another uh, list of things that you can look out for um, and possibly try to do something about um, you know the, the way that people behave on a on a one-to-one -one basis um, you have it. and uh, another couple of things to to look out for if you're kind of doing a, a secret assessment of someone um, to, to see whether you think they have this problem or not um, does that person have trouble handling criticism um, or things that they perceive as criticism um, do they always think that you're having a go at them certainly my dad falls into that category um, and maybe some of the people in the professions that we talked about earlier um, do, don't don't seem to be able to handle um, criticism in a professional and calm manner um, and just want to retaliate when when they're criticized um, and that links into the next thing which is does that person then become impatient or angry um, when when they don't receive special treatment or things don't go their way um, again that was manifested with my dad with um, mental and physical violence you know um, 
uh, certainly very impatient um, and, and extremely angry. Um, you just get through this, let this lady through. Thanks very much, cheers. Um, so that's the other thing. And um, another one is, um, does, does the pop, this person have significant interpersonal problems? So um, are they really easily slighted? Which is similar, you know, a very similar kind of thing. Um, do, do they react with rage? Um, all you have to do is go, and, go onto YouTube or any other site like that and um, there's, there's plenty of videos about um, interpreting body language. Yeah, the police do it all the time, um, the, the army and the, the armed forces are trained, some of them are trained to recognise uh, and medical professionals of course and, and us as human beings generally are um, we have a, an in, innate ability, most of us, to be able to, to, to recognise um, the, the small fluctuations in the muscles of the face, especially, you know, body language generally, but um, the small, um, the nuances of, um, of lips and eyes and nose and cheeks and all the muscles that constitute our face. Um, move in certain ways that is pretty standard throughout most of humanity to show disgust, um, love, care, all the, the range of emotions um, that we, that we um, deal with and deliver as human beings and rage being one of them. Try to teach yourself to notice the signs of these things. Um, another one closely linked is contempt. Um, this, is, this is one that you'll often see on uh, videos where um, body language analysis style videos um, where famous people or celebrities for example or politicians are being analysed by uh, someone that's trained in body language analysis um, so that the, the, what, the, what the person's actually saying um, it's um, it's some, sometimes completely different to what their their body language and their facial expression is actually telling you. Um, I remember one re recently with uh, one of the princes in the royal family. Was it Prince Andrew, I think? And he was um, he was analysed on YouTube. Go check it out. Um, when he was interviewed, he he volunteered for an interview, I think, um, to talk about connections to uh, was it prostitutes or something and a rich businessman in America and um, and what his face was saying was in complete contrast to what the words that were actually coming out of his mouth um, going slightly off topic there but rage um, do, does does the person that you know that you suspect have rage or contempt um, and try to belittle other people in an argument um, to make themselves appear more superior. Um, uh, again, tied into that is, does that person have difficulty regulating their emotions? Uh, are they unable to control their emotions and their behavior? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it speaks for itself, really. Um, does the person experience major problems dealing with stress? If you're moving house, or you're, uh, there's stress at work, or stress in the family environment, um, does that person um, have problems, big problems, dealing with that stress? The stresses of everyday life that most of us just kind of smooth over and, and cope with or deal with, um, to, to a large extent, um, these, these types of people might not cope with those so well, they won't, might not have strategies in place um, to help them get through those, those stresses and strains. Um, and adapting to change, that's another, another big one again that wasn't really um, evident in my dad, um, but he, in, in fact conversely, my dad seemed to really welcome 
change and was we you know like I've maybe mentioned before uh, the number of times that we moved house was just incredible always just moving house um, I remember at one point when we were really small my dad decided that we should all go to church uh, so we, we all piled down to this local church on a Sunday and um, and my dad tried to get us all involved um, you know on the, on the social side of the, the church activities um, but took a disliking to the people that were there and therefore you know a couple of weeks later we were traipsing across town to a different church he was adamant that we that we needed to all start suddenly believing in God but wasn't happy with the actual people that were delivering all of that um, I think we went to about three or four different churches at the end and, and he still wasn't happy. Um, my dad was the sort of guy that every time he moved house, the neighbours were never up to his standard, ne never up to scratch. And that was probably one of the reasons why he always felt it necessary, or at least it con contributed um, to one of, the, you know, one of the reasons why we actually um, moved house so many times, because he just was never happy with the area the neighbours, um, you know, instead of actually doing some research into it before you go, um, and or just accepting things as they are, uh, never happy with that. Um, does the person that you suspect, um, are they always depressed and moody? Um, um, but everyone gets depressed and moody, of course, yeah. Um, before coffee in the morning, I, you could, that's me to the tea. Um, no weird pun intended, but the, you know, does the person that you, that you know um, feel depressed and uh, moody because, because they feel that they fall short of perfection? Are they, are they completely um, distraught when, um, n you know, nothing's perfect, um, which could be most of the time for, for some of these people? Um, does the person that you know have secret feelings of insecurity, uh, shame, um, vulnerability and, and humiliation? Um, again, another, another four words there that, that could be underlying um, someone that on the surface of things appears to be charming and debonair and um, uh, what was the word that I used yesterday charismatic you know um, bombastic um, the, the life and soul of the party um, and and pushes their way to uh, fair means or foul to the top of things to the top of the pile and yet maybe they're deep down they're, they're harboring um, insecure feelings about something or shame about something that they've done or said or are they do they feel vulnerable in in various different situations or humiliated by by something um, about themselves or about their lives so there you go there's a another catalogue of um, traits that you can look out for um, again, as I said yesterday, go and research it yourself, you know, if you're, if you're worried about it, go and check it out um, online, uh, there will be links below for you to check that out, um, and, you know, there are other things too, like the people that um, break rules often, um, often fit into the same category, uh, people that have problems with drugs or alcohol addiction, um, can also often fit into the NPD category. Um, people that uh, in social situations maybe they're always kind of um, invading your boundaries, if you like, your personal space. But do you know someone that's always doing that? They go, whoa, back off a bit, you know, give me some space. Um, do When you're having a conversation, with someone, do you, do you know someone that, that's, that not only has to control the conversation and be in complete command of the conversation and where it's going, but also if any other people speak, interrupts and just 
has to stop other people from saying what they want to say because they they don't care about other people's feelings or what they want to say. Um, they want to take control of everything. Uh, there you go. What a subject, hey? Um, it's interesting. It's also interesting to me playing it out in my mind and speaking about it um, on camera. It's interesting to me how much everything connects together with all this. You know, the, the professions that I've talked about in the past, um, earlier, and, um, and my dad, and it's all kind of coming together. And I'm quite concerned that a far larger proportion of society has some kind of level of um, MPD associated uh, problems uh, far more than, than we imagined um, and it's, it's a sad thing that probably needs treating and sorting out somehow and uh, let's, hope, let's hope that that happens and that as time goes on, too, light, too late for my dad obviously, but as time goes on um, that something can be done about it and hopefully not drugs, man-made drugs but you know some kind of therapy of some kind or um, social intervention can can help to cure this phenomena anyway as you can see canal basin cup of tea time see you later